You're American, I'm American. What the hell? We all Americans. Why we just be all Americans? Yeah, we are. We all Americans, but we live in two different Americas. That's what it is. People forget that. And I don't think everybody that doesn't understand what we go through is necessarily racist or bigoted. That's, that's a far jump. It's a lot of folks that just straight up don't know what it's like. You got to educate them. You got to educate them on the kind of America you live in. I'd go to Best Buy and give a dude some straightening. <laughs> Straighten his ass out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm straightening. Dude at Best Buy going to decide I don't need a bag with my purchase. You just have an iPhone case. I figure you could just pop that open. I, no, I ain't popping shit. You put it in the bag. I need that in a bag. What do you need a bag for? I understand why you need a bag. It's wasteful, recycle. Don't you care about the earth? I go, sir, this has nothing to do with the earth. I'm a black man in America. I gotta leave this store with a bag, bro. Right? It's about safety. I'm black. I don't get the luxury of just walking out with shit in my hand. That is a roll of the dice. That is a horrifying day. If I would no, not only do I need that bag, bitch, I need that receipt. <laughs> and staple it to the outside. I don't want a receipt in my hand. You staple my receipt to the outside like Chinese carryout. And I hold it up in the air. I lion king. I hakuna matata. An iPhone case out of Best Buy. For me and my stand up, if I haven't made you uncomfortable somewhere in there, then I don't think I've done my job. And I'm not there to make you smile and feel, but this is going to be a real conversation about stuff that's happening in the world. Now, that might be a couple goofy ass jokes somewhere in that performance, but somewhere in there, there needs to be something that speaks to an honest observation about the world. And I don't think every comedian sets out to change the world and the politics and the blackness, but even if it's just about relationships, it's still your truth. You've experienced something and you're reporting it back to the people. And to me, that is the type of comedy that will always fly the, the furthest and the highest, is comedy that is a reflection of the human condition. The role of black comedy with what's happening in the world today is no different than the role of black comedy from the beginning. It's all about telling the real story from our perspective. What better place to be able to tell your story than on a stand-up stage with freedom of speech and letting it just go? As a comic, I've been there before, right? Well, I needed to go to the club. So if something crazy happened in the news where I was like, yo, I don't know how to deal with this, my, I, for me, right away, I'm going to the comedy club. And I don't care if it's just for me to do a set or, or if I'm coming there just to watch some other cats do their thing, because I need the laugh. Red Fox said it to uh, Malcolm X. You got to do something to get people excited and engaged. And a sense of humor is the best thing where everybody can meet at one place. You can laugh people into some truth, and you can hit them with some realities of what's going on in the world. Sometimes I like to have fun, and it's all fun shit. And then sometimes it's like, you know what? This is the fucked up shit that's going on in the world. And a lot of times when you're a black comic and you're, and I'm mainstream comedy, sometimes white people don't want to hear that shit, you know? Or they want, they tune in when it feels comfortable for them. Comedy, especially in the black community, truth to power. I always say we the third eye. We right below the pastor. It's Jesus, it's your clergy, then it's comedians. I'm not preaching. I'm a stand-up comic. My first uh, priority is to entertain you. If I'm making you laugh and I'm educating you at the same time, brilliant. So I talk about police brutality in my set, but I do it in a way you don't even realize I'm talking about police brutality. And then you go, oh shit. I don't care about Starbucks banning Wi-Fi for, for porn. That doesn't interest me. That's for white dudes. 
You know it's white dudes. <laughs> Black guys get arrested just for not buying coffee. <laughs> Can you imagine if they got their dicks out? <laughs> I shot the penis. The penis was resistant. <laughs> We have always, from the Richard Prize to the Dick Gregory, God rest his soul, made society see what they was doing to us in a comical way. And just laugh about it to keep from crying about it or being valid about it. So I, I take that on. I take on that responsibility very serious. I have to talk to my people and say, yeah, this happened to me too. I hate to see any baseball player having trouble, but that's a great sport for my people. That is the only sport in the world where a Negro can shake a stick at a white man and won't start no ride. <laughs> Dick Gregory represented us not just as a stand-up comedian, but as a civil rights activist. Dick Gregory spoke when I was a freshman in college. The way he schooled me, Megra Evers schooled him, and it was all about doing the right thing for all and not one. Great men have said before that a soldier can fight for his country against another country, but it takes something like a super special man to fight his country when it is wrong. If you're a black entertainer and you talk about race, it's, you're going to take a hit. Like, it's just natural because there's always going to be backlash. Same thing with, like, Kaepernick. Like, white people don't want to see you talking about the issues. They just want to laugh. You're just a comedian. Just stick to your J-Dub. I feel more connected to artists that use their platform, especially if you get the opportunity to be in white rooms on white television in front of white people, especially white people that generally don't see you. You should be talking about the issues, but at the same time, you need to stay funny. And I think that's what separates a great like Dick Gregory, is he was able to be political and still funny, because at the end of the day, people want to laugh. You can always laugh at problems that's right. Everyone in the whole world knows this is a wrong. So then you can make humor out of this and matter like you enlightening people on just what's going on. It's like one of the last bastions of free speech that we have is through comedy. You know, we used to have the last poets, you know, Nikki Giovanni, and we don't have poets anymore that are famous. Poets that can speak for us, you know. This revolution will not be televised and all that. We don't have anybody holding our fists up. The only people we have left is comics. We won't be censored. We don't give a shit. Wanda Page had a lot to say that people don't realize. Marsha Warfield. I really like watching the news, though, because on the news, they have their own language. It's almost like they're talking in code. See, they even have a code word for black people on the news. It's youth. A <laughs> uh, 35-year-old Detroit youth. <laughs> was today shot and killed by a 14-year-old Utah man. <laughs> think about it, think about it. Something that comes uh, readily to mind, the cover of Bicentennial Nigger has prior uh, in a chain of different fires, right, in different forms. He's a boxer, he's a preacher, he's a businessman, right? And the figure holding the chain is Uncle Sam to the corner. And so that in itself physically, back in the day when album covers were also part of the humor. So already performing a, a definite critique of the celebration of America in its bicentennial and the persistence of enslavement in different forms uh, in 1976. Richard Pryor is easily the best chap to do it. Richard Pryor had a line, you go to jail looking for justice and all you find is just us. No white person can absorb that the same as a black person. Like a black person is like, yes, thank you for saying. Exactly. It's a moment of truth for black people and it's a moment of realization for white people who are getting for the first time, a lot of them for the first time, to see the world through a black man's eyes. Police got a chokehold they use out here though, man. They choke niggas to death. I mean, you'd be dead when they threw. Right? You, did you know that? Wait, the niggas going, yeah, we know white folks. No, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, two grab your legs, one grab your head, it'll snap. Oh, shit, he broke. <laughs> can you break a nigger? Is it okay? Let's check the menu. Yep, page eight, you can break a nigger right there. See? Let's, let's drag him downtown. Okay.
It's, it's, the, it's the window into black life, black opinions, black thoughts. You know, you look at somebody like Chris Rock and some of the brilliant shit he said. White people wouldn't even understand some of this shit, at least politically, if he didn't say it. <laughs> the white man thinks he's losing the country. Affirmative action and illegal aliens and we're fucking losing the country. Losing? Shut the fuck up. White people ain't losing shit. If y'all losing, who's winning? Then you got a guy like Cat Williams who I... Now, I don't think Cat will ever get the credit he deserves for being as smart as he is. He says something back in The Pimp Chronicles Part 1 that I wrote a um, thematic essay on, and I got an A on it, because he said something about the war. You don't believe we gangsters? Tell me what the Iraqi uniform look like. <laughs> don't worry, I'll wait. Because <laughs> you ain't never seen that motherfucker. We ain't killing they army, nigga. We killing them. We over there killing niggas in sweatpants, tank tops. <laughs> Flip-flops and a cowboy hat. You shouldn't have been talking shit. Then I thought about it. I was like, I don't know what that uniform looks like. So he's right. We really are killing people, and we don't care because they don't classify them as people. They classify them as insurgents. That's brilliant. I'm going to be honest with you. White guys, you guys are... It, don't nobody trust y'all now. <laughs> don't nobody trust you. And it used to be like the crazy looking white dude nobody trusts. A, a white nigga in khakis, I'm getting the fuck out. Do you hear me? <laughs> if he looks like he manages the Arby's, I got to go. What is, what is he doing here? <laughs> no, I never adjust, which is why it's taken me 17 years to make it. <laughs> People are like, oh, where you been? I've been here just trying to figure out my life. I go on stage and I that's what I deal with. Like, whatever I'm going through, whatever is going on in the world, I deal with it. Because sometimes I, I'm nonsense. It's fine. But I want to say something, you know? And that doesn't mean that I always hit the mark. It just means that I'm, I want to say something and I want to make sure that I make a, a great impact. And my responsibility is maybe sometimes to my detriment, is to always push this narrative that if we still don't have it easy as black people. And not that we want it easy, but we should just at least have some form of rest. I should be able to wake up and be like, oh, I'm gonna live my day as Yamanika and not have an experience as I go through the world where it's like, oh, somebody doing some shit because I'm black, or this, I'm being treated this way because I'm black, or I'm a woman. Sometimes you can feel um, powerless. And comedy, for me, is the thing that makes me feel powerful. When we do go out to see comedy, we seek it. We go out and we seek it. I need to laugh, you know, because something's going on. I got one bit about, um, we always talk about white male privilege in this country, but we never talk about white female privilege, which I think is a lot more privilege. When I hit that beginning part and I say that, you'll see some of the looks go like, <gasps> what? What, what privilege? Then when I break it down, and I get to one of my first bits in that joke. I wish I could be as comfortable around the police as drunk white women. And I start breaking it down about things I see them get away with versus what we can get away with. And this is a true story. I seen a white girl pissing between the cars and this officer was being so patient with her. Ma'am, could you please? Ma'am, when you're done. Ma'am, could you please? And she turned up, looked at him and said, get out of my face, you fucking pig. And there was a part of me that's looking at that that's like, word, you tell him. You fucking pig. But then there was a bigger part of me knowing that I couldn't get away with that. The kind of wanted to see the officer tase her just a little bit because you need to know it's real out here. I couldn't get away with half of that shit. Meanwhile, he's calling you ma'am miss and all that. I've been called nigga for not turning around fast enough to talk to the cops. So, you know, sometimes they have the adverse reaction, but if it's a good joke, they'll take it as long as you get to a good punchline. They'll laugh at it and at the end. Eating and breathing have become unexpectedly dangerous in my life. I'm actually gonna stop calling my allergies that. That's a wimpy name for something that might kill you out of nowhere. So I'm now gonna call my allergies my police, exactly, because they might erase my existence and people will react the same way. Why'd you go outside that day? You guys know what I mean? Exact same disregard for human life. Okay, some of you with me. Some of you feel weird about race and that's fine because that's how I woke up. This morning and every single morning I've woken up. Just, what, black again, hope I make it. <laughs> the police are out and it's already skin 30. I'm a contestant on, will this get me killed? Anyway, guys. Um... Come with me or not. 
When I moved from Atlanta to Indianapolis, there was no urban scene, so it kind of forced me into the mainstream circuit. So I would tell these stories and people would be blown away at how I was raised, you know, the type of parents I had, the environment that I came from. That's what they're learning when they're coming to my show. Like, hey, you want to close your door and act like people like me don't exist, but it does. I'm 16 years old. I got two kids, two and one years old, and I'm living in the hood in Atlanta. And in this hood, I'm, you know, I'm trying to survive. So I go out and start me a small business. Well, I was selling crack, but we're gonna call it a small business tonight. <laughs> okay, white people. <laughs> I always had to keep a client in the car with me because I was 16 years old with a learner's permit and I didn't want to risk the chance of losing my fucking permit. I think it's an eye-opener when I'm standing on stage talking about my life so honestly. And I'm a girl. See, you really don't hear girls say they traffic cocaine, they've been shot. And I, I have this little saying where I say, hold my hand, white woman, I'm about to take you to the hood. You let it go, they're going to get your ass. And I just walk them through all these crazy stories in my life. And I bring them back at the end in the comedy club and set them in their seats. Oh, um, I just wrote it uh, yesterday. Um, I was at a Hawks game, just because you know I must have been bored if I go to a Hawks game, and I bought the ticket. I was in the concession stand, and I had a friend beside me, and I said, damn, the Hawks are really whooping some ass today. They beating the Knicks. And it was a young lady beside me, a sister. I said, I'm sorry for using that language in your present, using ass. Excuse, please forgive me. And uh, she said, no, nah, it's cool. I'm just, you know, it didn't offend me. It's just that I was just worried my mother didn't need to hear this. She's 82 years old. She don't need to hear, you know, that kind of language. I said, well, she's 82 years old. She didn't hear words worse than ass. Not my mother. I said, yes, she is, 82. Like what? Like. Nigga, get off my porch. <laughs> you want to vote? Recite all the ingredients that's in shampoo. <laughs> Give me the national anthem backwards <laughs> and then read it to me forward and tell me the 54th word in the national anthem. Your mother done heard some worse shit. If she's 82 years old, then ass. She said, not my mother. She lived up north. I said it was everywhere. And that was my point. I used to do this bit about the first slave that ever had to read, right, and the whole process of this. I was thinking to myself, I'm like, we don't appreciate or talk about enough the legacy of the people that survived so that we could be here, right? All the slaves that made it and didn't die and, you know, just went through the whole process. So many times people are telling you, like, let's forget that. Let's not talk about it. Slavery's over. We're done with that. I'm like, but what, if, what about those unsung heroes that we don't really have documentation on because nobody was writing the stories down? And most of the stories that did come from that were from a white perspective of what was going on. And I said, how hilarious that must be to be like the first black person that was like sent up north to read and then you try to, you're so proud of all the accomplishments that you made and that you made it up north and now you want to do is write a letter and you want to send it back to them but you got to send it to Massa's mailbox because them niggas ain't got no mailbox. And then he like, well, what the fuck is it? Who the fuck? Who getting letters to rap? You know, it's like this whole, this whole world. And so at first when I, I said, nobody wants to hear that. Right? And then as I went into it and people started to laugh, I go, oh, how crazy can I make this world? What, what can I say? And it just starts to add layers. I mean, that's my process. I don't know how other people's process. Some people's process is I just want people to like me when I go on stage. And I don't think like that. I just want people to hear what I'm saying and like it. But um, I went to a psychiatrist. And for those of you who are like, I'm happy, what's that? It's like, Shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> no, you go to a person, you tell them all the deep, dark secrets you can't tell your friends, they throw pills at you, and some days you feel all right. <laughs> a lot of my first jokes and half my material now is sad things that happened to me or things that bothered me or something someone said to me that made me feel bad, and then I made that into a joke. I've gotten to like sort of exercise a lot of things that I, a lot of issues I had with being a kid, a lot of issues I have being a black woman, and it's just because if you're, as a black person, a person, any person of color, you're just, you're going to experience more trauma and 
that's just an amazing way to deal with that is to be like, like this thing hurt me. Like I talk about depression, for example, that's not fun. It's not fun for me to go through that. But when I talk about it on stage, I feel better. I feel seen. I, it's not a, a scary, embarrassing thing about me anymore because I'm telling you and I'm changing the narrative with my jokes. First question he asked me pretty early, he was like, do you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, a relationship? I was like, yeah. He was like, do you love him? And I was like, <laughs> what did he say? I don't say it first. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think that was amusing. Uh, <laughs> So also taken back. He's like, that's a little inappropriate given the setting. And I was like, but doctor, all the worlds will stay. Okay, inappropriate, yep. <laughs> he was like, um, do you do drugs? And I was like, ah, <laughs> it's inappropriate. I, I'm getting this, yep, 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 yep. I paid a lot of money, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Towards the end though, he got really serious. We were having a good time. <laughs> and then he was like, you suffer from suicidal thoughts. And I was like, yeah, like honestly, like, that's a big part of why I came. I have those thoughts. But whenever I think about what it would do to my friends and family, it makes it something that's impossible to go through with. And this man looked at me and then looked at his notepad and he was like, <laughs> not if you're determined. <laughs> what? <laughs> but now I'm kill myself so fucking bad. <laughs> I have a best friend, name is Mike Machoki. And um, I was speaking to him one day and I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm about to finish college, I'm, 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 I'm doing my thing. And he's like, man, you gotta get on stage, man, you're funny. Like, we had you hosting events back in college, you gotta go on stage. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna go on stage, I'm gonna do it. And I knew I was gonna do it then. About a week later, he and his fiance got murdered when coming home from their, uh, from their engagement party. Losing them was something that still like haunts me. It, it, it has me depressed. It, 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 there's things that I go through just like losing some, losing two people like so suddenly, right? Now I'm able to talk about it on stage. But when I talk about it, I make sure, like I, like I kind of quote unquote bully myself because I'm like, all right, you could talk about depression, but don't you be that sad nigga on stage. You still gotta be funny. When I talk about depression on stage, like when I'm getting into it, it's like the best feeling in the world because like I see audiences, I, like I see the response, especially like if I'm doing an all black show, I'll see a response of like people laughing and then there's other people who are just like laughing and looking at me like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like like they get it. It's, it's not just a joke to them, it's real. And it's just a good bonding experience because I think that black audiences, when they see me do that, they're like, you know what, yeah, we can, th this is good to talk about, we can talk about it, so yeah. I don't like walking up behind white women at night. <laughs> Makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> so I cross the street. <laughs> if I was a white woman, I would rob black dudes. <laughs> I walk up to black guys and be like, hi, my name is Sarah, give me your wallet. Sarah, that's my grandmama name. Give me your wallet or I'm gonna scream. Up, 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 here, here, Sarah. <laughs> Look at some of the white women like, wow, we could actually do that. <laughs> so one night I was walking up the block and this white woman was in front of me, so I went to cross the street. And then when I got across the street, there was another white woman there. So my only option was to walk in the middle of the street. And, you know, I didn't. Uh, and I was just like, you know what, fuck this. <laughs> What's so sad about the whole feeling is that I don't want to make her uncomfortable. When, you know, if you break it down, that's her problem. Because I'm just trying to get home just like you. And society has painted this wicked picture of us where we're not given the benefit of doubt. From that, I wound up talking about it on stage and I turned it into a joke. Black people react to it with like, you damn right, that's right, <laughs> you know? And it's the dudes normally like, yo, that's what's up, yeah. And white audiences are a little taken aback at first and then they jump on it. Then it's like, oh my God, I can't deny this. Like, this is his factual feelings and truth of what he does. We all have a mission statement in this uh, big movie called Life. Number one, to alleviate pressure you know, in these times, we, we, we under a lot of pressure. That's comedy's job. We gotta alleviate the pressure that people are under. Then we gotta educate. Because the news is so slanted and propaganda right now, 
we have to now educate ourselves so that we can educate through our humor what's really going on out here. I firmly, firmly believe that all the best philosophers through the generations just stopped majoring in philosophy and just became comics, you know? Like, the most brilliant people you talk to make you laugh about whatever it is that they're talking about because if you're laughing at it, not only do you not have to let it be as, uh, as serious of an idea, but you also just, you understand it better. To me, being a black comedian in America means that you gotta stand up for something, you gotta say something in your material. That's, I mean, our greatest, I guess, comedian that everybody talks about, Richie Pryor, he said something. Dick Gregory said something. Like, say something, because that's what we come from in our material. Our kings, they said something, they made points, they pointed out injustices and made fun of it. Say something. Ha, ha, ha.